Well, how many of you remember that tonight I said I was going to give away a $100 bill? <laughs> how many of you are excited about this? All right. Well, I got, I got something to tell you. There's not a $100 bill. There's two $100 bills. Okay, now just for just kind of disclosure here on the front side, I was not bribing anyone to come tonight, but if you came tonight because you thought on the outside chance, it very well could be possible that you could walk away with a $100 bill, that would be good, yeah? All right, so I just got to be honest, you know, I'm given one of my $100 bills and there's somebody else in the church who said, Pastor Jeff, I want to contribute to that and I want to be part of this too, so... There are two $100 bills to be given away tonight. I would ask you if you want to look under your pew, but there's nothing under the pew. <laughs> I thought about maybe hiding some in hymnals. I didn't really know. I mean, honestly, I had no real purpose or plan in this other than this. I'm just going to tell you. Tonight I'm talking about prayer. And here's what I thought. If I tell people I'm speaking on prayer tonight... What kind of attendance do you think we would have? <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just, it was just an experiment, but the reality is, is there are two $100 bills. I want to ask all of you to stand, and I don't want any, like, chaos, or I don't want anybody trampling somebody else. And this is just an act of generosity and a little bit of fun tonight. You know, there's something uh, about, uh, you know, money that just motivates us. But I want our hearts to be motivated tonight by God's love, his presence, and accessing that through prayer. So, uh, but before we do that, here's, here's, here's how it's going to work. There are two people in the room. You don't know who they are. I do. They don't know who each other is. But there are two people in the room who have a $100 bill on them. And their instructions are to give that to the 11th person that shakes their hand. So, <laughs> hold on. So we're gonna promote a little bit of fellowship here. You need, okay, and it's not just like high five and on to the next person. This is like a handshake where you look them in the eye and say something, at least say God bless you or something because they could very well hand you some money. You don't know who they are, but I would just encourage you to shake as many hands as you can. We're gonna give a couple minutes. I don't have a watch, but we're gonna give a couple minutes to this. Everybody's, everybody, everybody is eligible except for pastors, okay? So have fun, shake hands. If you don't know somebody's name, take a moment to uh, just introduce yourself in your handshaking and let them know. This is fun. We need like some Jeopardy music or something playing behind it. <laughs> you might want to spread out a little bit. Hey, we have one right here. Louise, congratulations. There must still be, is there still another one out? Still another one out, keep shaking hands. There's still another $100 bill. Nobody's shaking, nobody has shaken my hand. Yes, I had one this morning. Do we have, do we have another one? Do we have another one? Deb, Deb Witcher, hey, congratulations. Two uh, $100 bills have been handed out. Go ahead and have your seats if you will. Uh, I, I hope that there's value in just being face to face with people. How many of you met somebody tonight that you've never shake, shook in their hand before? Shaken, you didn't shake them, all right? 
I hope that you made a new friend, and even if you were just motivated because you thought they might have a $100 bill. But uh, so, Louise, where's Louise? Yes, I, I had like three people shake my hand. All right, Louise is getting, she's posting it on Facebook. She's, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna have fun with that. All right, Louise, congratulations. And Deb Witcher, Deb, stand up. If you don't know Deb, Deb and her husband Steve, $100 bill. Very good, very good. Thank you, thank you for participating in that. There is like really, um, there's, there's, you know, that, I would say easy come, easy go. That was the money that came to me uh, for something a long time ago, and it was been sitting in my wallet for a long time. And um, Pastor Weaver had told me a story about a, a pastor friend that he uh, had said, you know, they were in a, they were in a prayer service, and uh, they were just encouraging people to come and pray at the microphones. And the pastor literally asked, you know, someone to come and pray for this. And I don't know, the congregation about like this, and no one came to the microphone. And, you know, kind of awkward or whatever, and asked for some, something else, and asked someone to come and pray for that. And nobody was coming to pray. They'd come to this prayer meeting. Nobody had come forward to pray. And he got to thinking, you know, he carried a, a few hundred dollar bills in his pocket just led by the Holy Spirit because he didn't know when the Holy Spirit may say, you know what, I want you to, I want you to bless somebody with some money. I don't know if any of you uh, have a ministry like that, but uh, you know, you wanna, you wanna make an impact on somebody. Uh, that, was his, that was his plan, his mission, and, and the Holy Spirit just spoke to him, you've got a few hundred dollar bills in your wallet, and he just laid them out on the platform during that prayer meeting and set them across the front and said, hey, anybody who wants a $100 bill, just come up and get them. And he said it was just amazing how quickly people responded <laughs> to getting money, but not to pray. And I'm not trying to bring any conviction on anyone who came tonight just for the sole purpose of getting $100. I, I, I think we, you know, if we could do that all the time, that would probably shut our church down. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and it's not about, it's not about that. I, I think that's just something fun and I'm glad. I'm glad for you, Louise. I'm so glad. Because here's what I know. I, I, I don't know how Louise can, could use that or needs that or whatever, but Louise is like a, Louise is like a, 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 a pipeline. And the Lord just pours into her and it just goes through her and she she uses whatever God gives her and she makes sure that she's faithful to minister however. And here's the thing, I'm speaking on prayer tonight. Louise should be up here speaking on prayer, not me. Barb Kelderman should be up here speaking on prayer, not me. There's a whole lot of you out there that could be speaking on prayer instead of me. But I'm the guy with the tie on, so I, 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 it's, my, uh, it's my lot tonight. Pastor Weaver said, you know, when he, when he, um, when he started the church, the Lord had spoke to him the important things. One is what he spoke on this morning is that we reach the lost. That we be a church that reaches the lost. And I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited. Pastor Kerry, how many, how many responses did we have today? About 400 different ideas. Imagine if we could gather around 400 different ideas of things that we already are passionate about in this, in this life, that we could do life together with those people and bring people into our circle and just do what is just something that we're passionate about and use that uh, to reach people, to get to know people, to love people. What, a, what an incredible idea. And I think that could be the thing, potentially, that could change our change our church and our community you know so you collect baseball cards for the glory of God because that may connect you with somebody else that would never have a connection somehow some way and so be just be be open to what God would would do put on your heart to say here's how I can here's how I can reach people you don't have to be you don't have to be an incredible uh, communicator just love people and gather around what you're passionate about. Evangelism, that's, that, that's one thing. Uh, one of the hallmarks of our church. Uh, two would be missions. 
Next Sunday, we've got the National Speed the Light director with us. It will be an incredible service. Don't miss it. And, uh, you know, we, we're believing for a miracle offering next week. If that offering is, uh, is so much greater than the offering for our building fund, great. You know, I'd, we'll send money around the, around the world. We'll, we'll build water wells and we'll make a difference in Africa and believe that God will help us right here in Urbandale, Iowa. Um, prayer. Prayer is something that we want our church to be marked by. That we would just be people of prayer. It's not... It's not over the top hard prayer is just a a a pipeline to communicate with the lord and it's a it's an opportunity it's a way that we have to communicate and next sunday night um, pastor carrie is going to be talking about uh biblical literacy just kind of just scratching the surface of something that we want to be known for people who know the word and so tonight tonight prayer Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. You know what that's called? That's called making room. That's called making room for God. If my people, he says, the people that I call by my name, humble themselves, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. You know, we create space for God when we, when we repent of our sin. We create space when we take time to seek God. He says, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. That's what we need. That's what we need tonight. The title is Making Room. And as part of the vision of our church is to make room and, and uh, be people of prayer. You read the Bible starting in the book of Genesis and uh, through uh, Exodus, the first two books of the Bible, and there is story after story of God's miraculous work among his people, starting with the creation account. God spoke and, and the world became. Uh, we have Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, We've got God's people crying out in the wilderness and God graciously hearing their prayers and delivering them from Egypt. The the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. The Israelites venture into the desert that would begin their journey to the land of promise. And then you get to Exodus chapter 25. And in Exodus chapter 5, all 25, all the way to chapter 40, almost 15 chapters of the book of Exodus, Moses goes on and on and on about the tabernacle in like specific details. I don't know how many of you ever got into those, those chapters of the Bible and you just kind of get like glazed over sometimes at some of the details of the things that were, were to be part of the temple, the place where, or, or the tabernacle, where, where the place that God's spirit would be, where his presence would dwell with his people in the wilderness. Seems like a a lot of chapters just to spend on the tabernacle, but then you get to the last verse of chapter 40. If if you're looking in your Bibles, um, and I'm sorry, I don't have any scripture on the screen for you tonight because I'm just not so good at that computer and I didn't have a whole lot of time. But if you got a pen and paper, you might want to just mark some of these verses down. But Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. After all the specific details of the tabernacle, this place where the presence of the Lord would be, it says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So suddenly all the descriptions and instructions make a lot more sense. You see, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of skill making some of those very specific things that you think, what was the purpose of that or what's the point of that? All has a purpose, it all has a point. But the details, we just kind of get glazed over and we kind of lose it a little bit. But it all has a purpose. It took work and skill to build a space suitable for God to fill. And only after God's people made room for him did he fill it with his presence. How many of us struggle to carve out space in our lives for God to fill? How many of you, that's a struggle? How many of you today are here to say, you know what, 
that is something that I've done in my life where God, I have made space, I've made room in my life, room in my schedule for God to come and fill my life. Almost 15 chapters of Exodus dedicated to making sure we know that God is completely holy and God desires to be with us. All of that just so that he could be with us. He delights in his people and he wants to be close to us. God wants to live among us. But he leaves it to us to create the time and the space to be with him. Good or bad. It's up to us. Just as the Israelites needed a tabernacle to meet with God and to share life in his presence and discover what it means to become his people, we need a tabernacle too. We need a place, we need a space to meet with God. Space in our lives set apart for him. Sharing life with him and discovering uh, how to become who God desires us to be. But finding that space and finding that place doesn't come easy. Otherwise we'd all be doing it. The challenge tonight is for us to make room. Make room because it doesn't just happen without intention. Make room for God, not because he needs it. He doesn't need it, but we need it. Do you agree? We need room for God in our lives. And prayer is the pipeline of communication between God and his people. So we make room for God in our everyday lives. We make time for prayer. You can be a Christian and not pray. You can be a Christian and not pray, just like you can be married and not talk to your spouse. But how many of you know that's going to be a miserable existence? You're not going to have a good marriage if you rarely or never talk to your wife or your husband. So here's a few thoughts about prayer that I want to leave with you tonight, and then we're just going to take time to pray. Simple, simple, I mean, there's so much that we could say about prayer, but here's, here's what I want to challenge you with tonight, that our prayer be persistent. Pray persistent prayers. Paul says in Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer. Devote yourselves to prayer. Continue earnestly in prayer is what the New King James says. So we need to per- per- persist in our praying. We need to adhere firmly to this idea. It's the whole idea of dedicating ourselves to time with God. Two of the most instructive parables that Jesus tells us on prayer in Luke chapter 11 and Luke 18 both have to do with being persistent in our praying and never giving up. Luke chapter 11 verse 9 there's, is this promise where Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. I think a better translation of that is, is to ask and keep on asking to knock and keep on knocking, to seek and keep on seeking. So Jesus doesn't want us to give up. Don't give up in your seeking. Don't give up in your knocking. Don't give up in your asking. He wants you. He wants you to ask. Be persistent. Don't give up. Luke chapter 18, verse 1, it says that Jesus told this parable to, uh, to his disciples. He told them this story, this parable, to show that they should always pray and never give up. And it's the story of the persistent widow who kept coming to the judge because she needed justice for whatever the, the situation that she, faced, that she was facing in her life. And it says that she just kept coming and coming and coming and bugging him and persisting and pestering him to the point. I mean, he didn't, he didn't believe in God. But he finally just gave in and gave up and said, I'll give you what you want because you're wearing me out with your coming to me. It's a, it's a story that Jesus told so that we would know how to pray. This is what he wants us to do. Don't give up. Be persistent in your praying. Some people give up way, way too easy. George Mueller said this about being persistent in prayer. He said it's a, a common temptation of Satan to make us give up reading the word and prayer when our enjoyment is gone. As if it were no use to read the scriptures when we don't enjoy them. And as if it were no use to pray when we don't have a spirit to pray. 
The truth is that in order to enjoy the word, we ought to continue to read it. The way to obtain a spirit of prayer is to continue praying. The less we read of the word, the less we desire to read it. The less that we pray, the less that we desire to pray. How many of you have been there? Yeah, it's just, it's just not a lot of fun. I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not getting out of it. But the more we do anything, you know what, the more that I drank coffee, I, 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 I was about 34 years old, and I just got so frustrated with the fact that people got together and drank coffee, and I was left out. It's tired of drinking Dr. Pepper or water when everybody else is drinking coffee. And I know there's people in the room that just don't drink coffee and you're old people, but you still don't drink coffee. <laughs> but I was like feeling left out and I'm thinking, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to learn how to drink coffee. I started out, you know, with that, that sugary stuff that you get out of the machine at, at, at Quick Trip. I don't think that's really coffee. It's just sugar with some, but you know, it has a little bit of coffee flavor to it. I still, to this day, I can drink black coffee, but it's not so pleasant to me. But I'd say I can do it now. I used to not be able to do that. I've persisted in drink. How many of you started out drinking coffee that way? It's like it really wasn't, it really didn't taste good, but after a while, you kind of develop a taste for it. Yeah? Some of you, maybe your first drink, it was just the best ever. I, I, I don't know what's wrong with your taste buds. You gotta have good coffee, I understand, and there's a lot of not so good coffee out there, but the more that we taste, the more that we try it, the more that we drink it, the more we develop a taste for it. And so we need to be persistent in our, in our praying. It may not feel like anything, but we need to be persistent. We need to make room in our prayer. The second thing is be passionate. If we're persistent in something, whatever that is, it stands to reason that you're probably gonna be pretty passionate about that thing, okay? H.K. Booyer, I'm sitting back here looking at him, I'm surprised he's not wearing green and gold tonight, but maybe they lost today, I don't know. Did they? Oh, they're still playing. Is that what you're looking down at you like this? (laughs) Or were you praying? (laughs) You know, here's what I can tell you about H.K. Booyer. That guy's passionate about the Packers. I've seen him... You know, you look good in green and gold, H, I gotta say. But you know what, we, we're pas- there's things that we're passionate about. The more that we do things, the more that we're persistent, uh, that passion shows through. So what about passionate prayer? Here, here's what passionate prayer is not. Passionate prayer is not emotion driven. You know, we think that if we're gonna be a passionate prayer, we've gotta be someone who can really pray an elaborate, you know, prayer with big words and and lots of emotion and, you know, whatever that might be. But you can pray passionately without having all the emotion, okay? We're not merely, uh, it's not merely an uh, emotional expression uh, when we talk about passionate prayer. And passionate prayer doesn't just flow from feelings. Sometimes we say, you know, I just don't feel like praying, but a passionate prayer, a passionate prayer prays whether they feel like it or not. Some personalities are more feeling based than others, but because someone doesn't have emotion in their prayers doesn't mean they're not passionate in their praying. So don't judge people based on their emotional expression. Passionate prayer is not always impressive. Maybe you say, yeah, that's me, I'm not a, I'm not a I'm, you know, I don't, I don't pray the impressive kind of prayers. Maybe that's the reason why those people didn't come up and pray in the microphones, because they're thinking, you know what, my pray- there's a lot of people who can pray better than me. That's, that's, that's not the effective prayer. It's not just somebody who can pray their words fluid. I mean, a lot of people can have the ability to speak. It's just like, you know, we have some missionaries that come, and some missionaries are very, very um, challenging and can really stir us up. And then there's some missionaries that come that just don't do a great job of speaking. But that doesn't mean they're not great missionaries. Some of those people are probably some of our better missionaries. Just because we're, we're fluent and flowery in our prayers doesn't mean we're, we're passionate prayers. You might stumble on your words, you might think, you know, I don't really know how to do that that well, but still there's a passion 
for prayer in your heart. Passionate prayer isn't someone who um, doesn't know Christian lingo. You don't have to know Christian lingo to, to pray passionate prayers. So don't, don't judge people's praying on the basis of their eloquence or their lack of eloquence. But what passionate prayer is, passionate prayer is a devotion to pray. You are going to pray no matter what. You're faithful, you're diligent in it, you're committed to it. It's a priority in your life. And you can choose to make that happen. That's making space, that's making room for God in your life. So passionate prayer is, is a devotion to pray. It's an attentiveness in prayer. Jesus taught us to be alert, to be watchful, to be self-controlled, be attentive. And going back to our first point, being persistent is what it means to be passionate in our praying. Never give up. Always keep on. Keep doing it. James 5.16 says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. It has great power and produces wonderful results. James goes on in chapter five to speak about Elijah, and he says this about Elijah. Elijah was a human being even as we are. Elijah was just a human, just like you and me. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Our most powerful resource in prayer is a relationship with God. That's what it takes. It's a relationship with God. It's God's power at work in us that accomplishes things. It's the Spirit of God and His power in us, not our own righteousness, not our own abilities, not our eloquence or, or lack of. It's God's spirit in us. This is Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3.20. To him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. To him. Him who is able to do infinitely more, immeasurably more than we can ask or even imagine according to his power that's at work in us. It's all about him. It's all about his power. It's all about a relationship with him. Philippians 4.16, I love, this, I love this scripture because, you know, when it comes to um, prayer, a lot of times we doubt and a lack of faith, sometimes we worry. And in Philippians 4.6, Paul says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. How many of us are prone to worry? He tells us in Scripture, don't worry about anything. Instead, he gives us an out here, okay? Don't worry. Instead of worrying, what do we do? Pray. And what is prayer all about? It's about faith. It's about exercising our faith in the one who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine. So when we feel like we're just gripped by fear and worry, what do we do? Pray. We're used to hearing this verse, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The NLT says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. The third thing that we need to do is be thankful. Be persistent, be passionate, and be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, always be joyful, Never stop praying. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful in everything. That's God's will for you. In our praying, we need to give thanks. Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. What does being thankful in prayer do for us? Several things. One, it articulates our dependence on God. Being thankful. You know what? Who supplies everything that we have? What does scripture tell us? God. It comes from the Father above. Every good and perfect thing. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. We are totally and completely dependent on him. 
that demonstrates a relationship with him. If we're dependent on him, there's a relationship. God, I need you. Every hour I need you. He's our everything, our all in all. We have to have a thankful heart for a God who is taking care of us, that we can depend on, who we have relationship. And that, that gratitude, that thankfulness communicates a proper attitude to him. God, I know that what I have is from you. And it's easy to give thanks. I say it's easy to give thanks. But how many of us are thankful to stop and and roll back a little bit and say, how did I get here? It's because of God. Even if you feel like you're in a storm, how did I get here? You know what? I don't know if it's because of God, but he's with me in this, and he's promised to work it together for good. So whatever I find myself in, I can be thankful because God's taking care of me. And what it does is it generates humility in us to we say, where we realize, I can't do this. I need God. We get too independent, too self-sufficient, and the reality is, is we need to be dependent on God. We need to walk in humility before him. And there's part of prayer that has this focus of it's not about me, it's about other people. I want to read this illustration and then I'm going to, I'm going to close, it, close this down. But it's by Howard Hendricks, uh, who was a, a professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. He's an author, he's a pastor. And this is a story. He said, years ago in a church in Dallas, we were having trouble finding a teacher for our junior high boys class. The list of prospects had only one name. And when they told me who it was, I said, you've got to be kidding. But I couldn't have been more wrong about that young man. He took the class and revolutionized it. I was so impressed that I invited him to my home for lunch and asked him the secret of his success. He pulled out a little black book. On each page, he had a small picture of one of the boys, and under the boy's name were written comments like, having trouble in math, or he comes to church against his parents' wishes or we'd like to be a missionary someday, but doesn't think he has what it takes. And he said, I pray over those pages every day, and I can hardly wait to come to church each Sunday to see what God has been doing in their lives. What if we took that kind of approach in our evangelism of what God can do in and through us? With a simple act of being obedient, being persistent, being passionate, being thankful in our prayers. Sometimes I think we don't become what God wants us to become because we're too focused on ourselves and not on other people. And when we pray for others, it's when we pray for others that we become more like him. And as we become more like Jesus, God will grow us more, he will show us more, and he will use us more. We ought to pray for other people. So just a a few questions tonight as we close. What does your prayer life look like? What does your prayer life look like? Are you persistent in your praying? Are your prayers passionate or are they just routine? Are they filled with intensity and fervor or are they timid and weak and lack faith? And what about thankfulness? What about gratitude? How much time have we spent thanking God for all that he's done for us? And who are we praying for? I'm I'm as guilty as anybody, and I don't intentionally forget, but how many of you have said to somebody, yes, I'll be praying for you? And if you don't write that down somewhere, it's so easy to forget. The reality is all of us could have pages I know there's people here in our church who have pages and pages of people that they pray for. And it may not be such fluent prayers. It may just be simply naming those names and what you know and asking God to move in their life. It's a good thing. Karen, are you able to play for me tonight? As Karen comes, just ask yourself those questions. Who who are you praying for? Is there anyone in your life that you're praying that will get saved? We should all have somebody in our life that we're praying for them to be saved. Is it the burden of our heart to see God's kingdom expand? And can God use us? 
want to just use this song as a, a song of closing for us just to prepare us for, for prayer. And I think that there's a lot of faith in this uh, song. This is a hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. How many of you know the song? It's all about prayer. Taking it to God in prayer. Will you sing with me? What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain because we do not carry all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer have we trials or temptations have we trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere heavy laden. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in friends despise forsake thee take it to the Lord in prayer in his arms he'll take and shield thee thou wilt find a solace there I'm going to ask the worship team to come up how many of you found in those lyrics of that hymn something that you identify with? Cumbered with a load of care, your friends despising, forsaking you, weak, heavy laden. At any point of my week, I'm several of those things. What do we do? Take it to God. Take it to God. Persistent, passionate, thankful. There's not one of us in this room that doesn't need prayer. That doesn't need to pray. So here's what I want to ask us to do. We're, gonna, we're just going to close by praying tonight. I'm not good enough and eloquent enough to be able to motivate all of you to walk out here and say my life is completely different because Pastor Jeff talked about prayer. But I know someone and a relationship and a connection with him changes everything. I'm guessing and believing tonight most of us have a relationship with Jesus. But how many of us, our relationship is like that married couple that never talked to each other? What's your prayer life like with the Lord? Would you commit tonight to make room in your life? 
And here's what, I, here's what I know. We can make some big plans. And you might say, you know what? I'm giving three hours a day and I'm making room. And if you're not used to doing that, it probably won't happen. But you could start with five or ten minutes if you don't do anything now. Start with five or ten minutes. In your day, set aside the same time every day. Maybe it's when you get up in the morning. Maybe it's when you go. To, maybe it's on your lunch time. Maybe it's in the car as you're driving. I don't know what it is. But I want to challenge us to be a church that prays, that believes for God to do things in and through our lives, that believes that God is going to save people that we know that we're connected with, that we believe that God could make a difference in our lives and through our lives if we will just take time to connect with Him. God will pour into you and download through you when you open up the pipeline and say, guess what, I'm, I'm on. We can stay on and stay connected all day long for him just to pour into us. But if we don't make it a point to happen, it won't just happen on accident. Would you stand tonight and just, I want to pray for you and I want to ask you just to find a place. Before you go tonight, find a place. Carve out some space. You've already taken time to come, hoping, praying, wishing you'd get $100. I promise you that what you gain from connecting in a relationship with Jesus through prayer far outweighs a hundred dollar bill. I know people who prayed money in. You know what? At times I've been the person who has been the channel because I heard God say, I want you to give those people three hundred dollars or whatever it might be only to find out that's exactly what they needed. You ever been there before? I would love giving away money a whole lot more than receiving money, but there's times when I've received and it's just what I needed. God knows what we need. Let's stay connected to Him. Father, I pray tonight that this church, New Hope Assembly, Urbandale, Iowa, that we would be known as a church that prays, that we would be known as a church that's connected with our Savior, that we would, that we would begin to grow in our relationship with you like we've never grown before because we've taken time to make room for you in our lives and we spend time with you and we begin to look more like you and begin to act more like you and begin to have a heart and a passion and a desire for the things that you desire because we've spent time with you. God, download and pour into us as we make room in our lives for you. God, we believe that you have a mission and a plan for us to reach lost people. But God, may our ears be open and may we hear your voice to know what to say and when to say it, to know who to talk to and when to talk to them, to know what to do and how to act and and, and when to give and when to serve in the right times because you are faithful to speak to us. You are faithful, God, to use us if we'll make ourselves available to you. Move in us and move through us, I pray. In Jesus' name, have your way in our time as we make room for you. Pour your spirit out in this place is our prayer. Move, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Just find a place this morning or this evening for prayer. It could be in your seat. Maybe you need to move. Maybe you need to fill the the altars up here, the, the pews, the benches, wherever it is. Make a step and move and just spend some time at least five, ten minutes that you would take time to spend with the Lord. If you need special prayer tonight, you've got a need in your life. If you feel led to pray, I'd encourage you just to stand up here. We'll pray for people if you have needs. But I just encourage you to spend some time on your own with the Lord tonight. And when you're done, you are dismissed. You are free to go.